The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you in peace. This short gospel reading today points to the theme of our continuous reading from Samuel. They both show us how God chooses to do great things through the person who seems insignificant or the little community that seems too tiny to, to do anything. And Jesus chose the mustard seed to describe the kingdom of, of, uh, of the growth of the kingdom coming from an unimpressive start. And people who like to show how much they know, they often point out that there are indeed bigger trees, and actually Luke is the only one that actually calls it a tree, but um, there are even bigger shrubs than the mustard plant, even if you confine yourself to that part of the world. So, aha, Jesus got it wrong. <laughs> actually, he would have been familiar with all kinds of plants where birds could build nests the famous trees, the famous cedars of Lebanon, in fact, were used for the building of the first temple. A Methodist minister friend who grew up in the deep south told me about one of her chores when she was a child, and that was to weed out the bean patch. And the most stubborn thing to weed out was mustard. Pulling it out, it, it only seemed to encourage it to pop up someplace else and, and with, with more force than ever. That is not a bad trait for a kingdom that Satan is trying to wipe out. And she said that the Northwest equivalent of a mustard plant, if you want to find the greatest of shrubs, it wouldn't be the Douglas fir. It would be those blackberry bushes that spring up where you didn't expect them and you cannot get rid of them. They just take everything over. If you read through the story of David's life, it was a series of narrow escapes and it called for a great deal of resilience kind of like a mustard plant. You will remember if you're here last week that the people of Israel were not satisfied with the governance of their country under judges. The real problem was that they didn't trust in God to be their ruler. So against all of the warnings of their prophet Samuel, they demanded um, that they have a king. It was based, as Pastor Lara pointed out, based on kind of childish reasoning. Well, everyone else is doing it. Everyone else has a king. Everyone else has a Barbie dream house, right? So uh, God relented and Saul was selected to be the king. And at least he looked the part. He was uncommonly handsome and he was literally head and shoulders taller than all of the other men. He seemed the sort of person who could stand up to the Philistines, their, their natural enemies. And Saul actually approached this new status with some humility. He underwent a kind of born-again experience that left him with some spiritual sensitivity, but that didn't last long, and Saul gradually began to do all of the things that Samuel had warned about. His rule became quite self-serving. He lorded it over the people, and what seemed like the last straw, he came to see war actually as a good thing. It was an opportunity to pillage the best of what other people had. That is why our passage today starts with Samuel grieving over Saul. Saul is still living, but he's been a terrible disappointment. Samuel really had hopes that Saul would serve God and serve the people, and it all turned out so wrong. And the Lord was sorry, too, about making Saul king. And maybe one of the first lessons we can take from our reading is that dwelling on disappointments doesn't solve anything. Neither does being paralyzed by fear. God says, how long will you grieve over Saul? I've rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil, which was before anointing a new king. Fill your horn with oil and set out. And it was natural that Samuel would think it was a dangerous mission. No matter, take a heifer with you um, for a sacrifice and go visit this herdsman in Bethlehem. Now, a family that keeps sheep, that is not a likely pedigree for a king. But then uh, Saul had also been the son of something like a donkey rancher, well enough off to have some servants, but considered a humble family from the smallest tribe of Israel. 
You might wonder if it was it a sign of future trouble or, or past sins that uh, this encounter with Jesse starts with the sacrifice, kind of like a, if you're thinking of an offering like an atonement for sin. Well, probably not. Sacrifices, sometimes they were used that way, but often they were just kind of a fellowship and thanksgiving and worship meal with God as the guest of honor. The sacrifice here cues us in that this, is, this family of Jesse is a family of faith. And then what follows must have been kind of awkward. The seven sons of Jesse passed before Samuel and none of them is chosen by God. Aren't there any more? Well, the youngest was out in the fields with his sheep, but Jesse had taken it for granted that David wasn't even worth mentioning in this case. And what's more, the youngest son is never supposed to go ahead of the older ones. This was turning custom completely on its head. And if you know how Bible stories usually go, seven is usually the number that represents completion. Um, and there were seven sons that failed the test here. David's number eight. I thought of the royal family of, of the United Kingdom. They are mostly figureheads. They're not really rulers, but they have quite a cultural influence. They set the tone and they're supposed to represent the best of the British character. Well, Edward VIII, um, he had a big splashy personality. I know for one thing, they like to send him out to meet the troops around the world. He was very good at, at getting everyone's spirit up. Um, he kind of looked like the king. No one dreamed that his niece would one day be the queen. That's not how the order is supposed to go. He, of course, abdicated the throne because when he fell in love with this divorced American, which is not really a, a sin or a crime most people would consider nowadays. His brother, George V, had not been groomed as king. He did not have the personality or the outward gifts to be a monarch. He dreaded the whole idea, especially with that terrible stammer that he had. But he and his wife, Elizabeth, were inspirational during World War II. And we know they had, of course, two daughters. Oh dear, that wouldn't do. And George and Elizabeth were seriously encouraged to try having a third child, try for a prince. This was the logic of the 1930s. And they refused to consider it because they didn't think it was anyone else's business and they felt that their family was complete. Also, they thought that Elizabeth would be a good queen someday. Why was that? Did she have big star personality? I guess uh, Edward, the, Edward the Eighth was considered quite a fashion plate. Some people might say she was the anti-fashion plate. But, but she had two things. She was very orderly as a child. Royal life is full of rules and customs. And she always looked out for the other person. In that way, she was very mature for her age as a child. She didn't put herself first. Whenever the family was going to do anything, she'd ask if this would be all right for the other people. You know, but what, what about all the people who waited on them in, in the palace? Um, what about the poor people? So the least likely one in the royal family had some very queenly traits. This reversal um, of the way things are usually done in David's story, that's often the way that God chooses to operate. The person who's overlooked the one with no status, no wealth, no power, is often the one who's chosen. Is that how we choose our leaders? In business or government or different organizations that we join? I think we have to admit that there are strengths that come with being born into advantage, being born into privilege. You might be learning at the knee of some successful person who kind of knows how it is that things get done. It's an advantage to be able to afford an education and participate in different edifying experiences. Having high energy, having high expectations placed on us, that helps. And good looks don't hurt either. I think high school reunions, and we just had one not long ago, they're often a testimony to that, to see how people's lives panned out. I know I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm daughter of long line of shopkeepers. I wouldn't have the personality or the background to serve in public office. I think everyone would walk all over me. So those things do count for something. The advantages in life, having a charismatic personality, being groomed for success, maybe you're partly your parentage, 
If we're honest, those are things that often do make for success in leaders. If those, are the, those things are the, the only thing that a person has, then that person might be pretty shallow as a leader with no thought to what life might be, be like for people who don't have as much. A person who has a humble background might have a lot of catching up to do, but God cares about character. And unlike Saul, David didn't think of himself as being at the top of the heap because everything in his life told him he wasn't. Well, not quite everything. Remember, the, the Lord told Samuel about David's big brother, don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see, they look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Well, David might have been less statuesque than his brothers, he was just a boy, but oh my, it says he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And again, my friends who think they know quite a bit more than our Bible readers have been known to say, oops, guess they forgot about Saul. He was the most handsome man in all of Israel. See how that turned out. I actually don't think that it was a goof up by the writer. I think just the opposite. People in synagogues reading this story would know the history of, um, of Israel a lot better than most of us. And this story of Saul would be fresh on their minds as they're reading this. I would suggest that God may be signaling to us, put a star by this verse, put a post-it note on this page. It's kind of like when you watch a movie or a TV show and the camera zooms in on some little detail. And you think, aha, that little detail is going to be important later on, so watch for it. David was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. So for all of the wonderful stories that you're about to read about David, this is not going to end entirely well, not for everyone. There will be lots of women and lots of bad behavior with them. And in our own day, David's problem may well happen with our leaders. Let the reader take note. And it will lead to great unhappiness. And also, we should never expect to find a leader, even one handpicked by God who has no weaknesses. But there are weaknesses like David's that he felt bad about, at least some of the time. And then there are weaknesses like Saul's that he indulged and he allowed to take over his character. He allowed them to become his goals in leadership to the point that God decided he needed to be removed from leadership. People had no peaceful way of, of doing that in those days, but God would see that Saul eventually would do himself in. Well, Saul was still living when Samuel took that horn of oil and anointed David, uh, anointing being the ancient equivalent of crowning him. It says, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. But what happened next? We're told Samuel went home. It seems there was no particular education or training or instruction for this new position for David. And actually, David didn't immediately function as God, uh, as king, from the, from the day of his anointing. Remember, he was anointed only in the presence of his brothers and presumably his father. No one else knew about it. So the reading that we had today, it breaks off without telling us about David taking the throne because that's not what happened. Now, if we were to read ahead, we would find that Saul continued to rule and David served him. And David would learn about the royal court by being there, by soothing um, Saul with his harp. He would accompany Saul to battle. And then as we heard a few minutes ago, he killed Goliath, the Philistine's um, giant. Saul would get jealous of David's battlefield successes and his popularity, and he actually tried again and again to kill him. And David never took advantage of this. He was merciful to, to Saul. He always acknowledged him as king as long as he was living. It would be years before Saul uh, gave himself up as defeated by life and defeated by the Philistines, and he committed suicide by falling on his own sword. Then finally, David was publicly anointed king by the other leaders of the people. So he was actually anointed twice. Now the men who presided over this ceremony, 
they had no idea that they were really just going through the motions of what God had already done. The anointing by Samuel was the one that God commanded. And in God's eyes, he was the king, even though he didn't take up the duties right away. Probably being a youth still, he probably wasn't ready. Do you suppose that this has gone on in your life too? Maybe you had a, a short or long time of preparation to dig into your mission, like David. Maybe you have had to wait for some person or some obstacle to be gone and use that time to prepare. Possibly the kind of work that God has for you will never be formalized with the equivalent of a public anointing. When God singles you out, people may or may not go through the motions of doing the same thing. But it's the anointing from God that gives you the authority in your work. And God has a mission, God has a purpose for all of us. We are anointed for God's purpose, whether the people around us realize that or not. Maybe your work is in full swing right now. Being a good neighbor, teaching your children, helping someone in need, being an encourager. This story was about kings. Now, not every youngest or quietest or per, uh, poorest or meekest person of goodwill is going to become a ruler. But that person may well be the one that everyone wants to be with when the chips are down and when hope is fading and faith is called for. Could that be any less important? You are a child of the king, and you're anointed and you're needed. Amen. Amen.